everybody, and welcome to Chat from the Old Cap. My name is Tony Hakes. I'm the Director of Regional Programs for the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. We have a very special guest today, Jason Snell. Jason is a multimedia artist who can compose live music with his mind, which we were just sawing. He's going to be wearing that brain monitor on his head and using his um, mind waves to manipulate synthesizers and drums. He's performed solo at techno, techno festivals across the U.S., and as far away as Germany under the moniker Primary Assembly. A journalism and mass communication graduate from the University of Iowa, Snell has composed nine film scores and his music appears in more than 75 albums in the electronic music scene. His music, motion, design, and filmmaking have been featured at the Sundance, South by Southwest, and Slam Dance Film Festivals. Jason, welcome to our program. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah, the, the pleasure is all ours. So, this has been really fascinating as we've been meeting with you leading up to these um, chats. And I gotta say that this is just really mind blowing, no pun intended, and that you're able to do this. So I'm looking forward to a little bit longer demonstration here in a few minutes. But before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, how you ended up at Iowa? Sure, I actually uh, grew up in Iowa and uh, grew up in Cedar Rapids and um, went to school here and then transferred to University of Iowa in Iowa City. Uh, in 98, um, no, I'm sorry, 95, and then graduated in 98. And um, I got my associates from Kirkwood and then my bachelor's from uh, Iowa. And I studied uh, graphic design, but at the time to really dive deeper into the graphic design softwares, uh, it was best to get a journalism degree. So technically my degree is in journalism, mass communication. And my secondary focus was through the art school, the School of um, Art and Art History. Um, and, you know, since then, uh, I moved to San Francisco, then Minneapolis, uh, then New York for nine years, and then California for about four or five years. And I'm fuzzy with the dates because around then I started traveling just almost all the time. And the last several years, pre-pandemic, um, I was traveling almost constantly, either on tour or meeting other artists and doing projects with them on location. So um, I tend to go to Berlin a lot. There's a lot of uh, artists there that I'm close with and have worked with. Uh, Los Angeles, I've worked with a really outstanding uh, dancer there and a motion sensor project I built. Uh, and then I've worked with a lot of artists here in Iowa, particularly at the university. Um, I've also worked a bit with the city of Iowa City. They've funded a number of my projects. So I've done different types of uh, performance and also installation art in Iowa City. So, wow, you, you're really um, deeply rooted in Iowa, but still have had the opportunity to travel the world, which is, is amazing. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Iowa. You know, was, how did you decide Iowa was the right school for you? We know, know we're you know, one of the best in the country, of course, but maybe share with us a little bit about your experience at Iowa, whether that was a favorite experience you had or a professor that inspired you. Mm -hmm. Well, it was both uh, the university and the city itself. Uh, I started going down to Iowa City uh, when I was 16. So as soon as I got my license, I started driving down. It's about a 30 minute drive from Cedar Rapids. So I started going down and uh, to the Ped Mall and I just, Cedar Rapids has its perks, but you know, growing up, essentially it was like go to the mall and to the arcade and uh, ride bikes around. And so to go to Iowa City to their pedestrian mall, uh, I don't know if you remember the Hall Mall, but uh, just you know, there was like a industrial music piercing shop. Moon Mystique was there at the time. Uh, there was uh, just different vintage um, clothing stores. Um, I mean, just things that I hadn't seen really in Cedar Rapids. Um, and also just the, there was a ton of independent uh, restaurants and cafes. There was one that, um, Bushnell's Turtle, and even the name was fun, but it's where Martini's is now. But I just remember going there in high school and just falling in love with Iowa City as a community and, um, and just everything it had to offer. Um, and so when I transferred there, um, I would say two professors really impacted me and became not just academic mentors, but uh, artistic mentors. And one was in the journalism school and one was in the art school. Uh, the one in the journalism school was uh, Kay Amert and she was in typography uh, and just taught me a lot about uh, layout and also with journalism. I think one of the important things 
that comes up a lot when I'm, you know, doing programming or, you know, creating something from scratch and I'm trying to figure out how to build something or how to reverse engineer something. One of the things I tell myself is I don't know this, but someone out in the world does. I just have to find it. And that's a skill I learned from the journalism school is I don't have the information right now, but I can find the person who does have that information in order to build or achieve what I want to achieve. Um, and then the art school through uh, print printmaking classes and foil stamping was Virginia Myers. And she was really a vanguard in her uh, career. She was one of the first women to um, move into being an inventor uh, in the printmaking um, arena and um, really at a time that was dominated by men. And so she uh, fought tooth and nail and really achieved a, a lot with uh, printmaking and, and the technique specifically she created, which was called foil stamping. Um, and she taught me a lot about uh, creating an environment in which art can unfold. And so one of her things was to always have your tools sharpened. And, you know, if I'm not feeling creative, what I do is I just make sure my studio is organized for when I do feel creative, everything's ready. I don't have to worry about plugging things in or finding a cable or, you know, getting something uh, arranged. And that basic concept has ended up influencing all of my art in general, uh, and including this, this project that I'll be showing today. Uh, the idea is, like, what you'll hear isn't pre-composed. I don't know what the composition is going to be, you know, when I put the headband on. Uh, I just know the environment in which those sounds will come up. And so the focus is on creating environments in which art and life and creativity naturally unfold. And so I'm less focused on the final product. It's not like I want to paint this specific painting or I want to create this specific uh, song, but I want to create an environment in which a type of song or a type of visual emerges organically and it's really influenced on the actual moment. And this EEG system is as close to the moment as I can get because it's reading my brain live, you know, where I'm at, what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, and translating that to music in real time. That's really incredible. I think you really capture the sort of uh, scene and atmosphere of Iowa City. I clearly remember my first time too, being down here um, as a teenager and you know, what a great thing for, what a great place and space for artists, just like you, you mentioned. I, I clearly remember the Hall Mall as well. Um, and those are, those are great memories. And like you said, great for artists, great for independent cafes, restaurants, music scene. Um, very cool. So let's talk a little bit more about um, this music that you make. How did you come up with this idea for, for this project? The setup uh, was based on a technology I had been building prior based on motion sensors. And I had been working with Bluetooth motion sensors that um, a dancer would wear. And their motion data would be sent via Bluetooth wirelessly to an app I made. And I would convert their motion into sounds. And so the, the framework for uh, having some sort of input that was... Uh, biological or organic or um, real time, that basic structure of taking an input and then bringing it into uh, a music generating uh, set of algorithms and then to output uh, MIDI. Uh, and MIDI is a musical instrument digital interface. It's a language that allows keyboards to talk to drum machines, to talk to sequencers. It's almost like um, sheet music, but for electronic music. And so I was taking motion and then converting it through uh, my system output MIDI and could control drum machine or a synthesizer. And what that allowed the dancer to do was as they danced, they were making the music live. And so the dancer was able to step into the composer role at the same time as dancing and create this really powerful uh, biofeedback loop where as they moved, they heard what they were creating and then could respond to what they just created with different movements or repeat the same movement and allowed them to really experiment with composing live. Um, I had some envy watching them. So I'd set up the system and I just would see dancers put this on and have so much fun, just the, the amount of power they would feel to be able to compose live. And um, I had that built and I had worked with a few dancers 
And then I had a dream late in 2017 um, about, uh, it was a concept album of making music based on human DNA. Uh, it was a real lucid dream. I woke up, I wrote it down. I still have the journal entry. And I started thinking, well, how could I make music that's based more on not my motion, not my external motion, but really the fundamentals of what make me a human, you know, just the basic building blocks of, of, of the body. And so I started, uh, I found um, a mapping of uh, human DNA on NIH.gov, uh, National Institute of Health, and started screenshotting those DNA sequences and converting them into musical notes and started work on some compositions based on that as a concept album. And so the idea was there when I saw, it was just a, it was literally, I was scrolling through Instagram and saw an advertisement for this uh, headband. So it's a, a Muse EEG headband. And it was what I was wearing earlier. And what it does is it reads the electrical output of the brain, um, both on the forehead and then there's sensors behind each ear. And when I saw, um, and it sold as a, um, they pair it with their own app and the app helps you learn to meditate and improve your meditation. It scores you and, and tracks your meditations. But when I saw the, the ad for it, I looked up the Muse and I looked to see if they had a software development kit for third party developers. Cause I was curious if that is Bluetooth, just like the motion sensor system I built, I wonder if I could, you know, get this EEG, hook it up into my motion sensor uh, system. Uh, the basic framework of it and play music. And just the idea was so sci-fi. I was like, I don't know. If, I mean, I have to try this. And so I bought one and within um, it arrived and within 36 hours, I had a basic prototype. I'd been watching some of the basic brain waves and how they behave. And I thought um, my intention was to, if I can drop my Delta waves, which Delta waves are, um, they have the most, um, amplitude they go up and down the most and i thought if i can drop my delta wave and have it play a key on a keyboard uh that was my prototype like can i play a key essentially with my brain without touching the keyboard just to like thing so i put it on and the keyboard would have a little light that would light up if the signal went through successfully so i put on the eg and i was like yeah <laughs> trying to think and I saw the keyboard light up and it was just a complete eureka moment of, I just played a note on a keyboard with my brain. And instantly I knew if I can play a single key, I can eventually make a symphony. I mean, just build on that and build on that and you know, watch how the brain behaves, see what I can do to um, control notes and create notes and, and shape music and uh, the, system has just you know evolved and built from there so multimedia artist indeed i mean you're combining music and technology and science and innovation um just hearing you explain that it's, it's uh, really you know checking a lot of boxes so is this your career i mean I, I know that you were touring prior to the pandemic and you've got some film work but is this what you're doing you know full time it is uh so the last few years I've been transitioning to be an artist full-time. Um, prior, I was doing uh, different programming and interactive work for mostly um, uh, large media companies in New York. Uh, when I lived in New York, I established really good relationships with a number of uh, companies there and continue to do that work. And um, I've always said, so when I, when work dries up or, um, I haven't worked in an office in a really long time, but you know, if there's a layoff in the moment, it feels terrible, but every single time it's happened to me, it's led to better things. And so that was one of the situations in 2016, I had a client I'd been primarily working for and, um, I was already traveling and trying to transition to art as much as possible. Just, you know, bit by bit, just percentage, you know, it was like 90%, um, client work, 10% of my artwork, and then 80, 20, and then 70, 30. And so slowly, month by month, year by year, trying to, you know, dedicate more time to art. And the more time I spent on art, the more it would grow. And then in 2016, um, I was in Paris. Uh, and I got a text from my client in New York. And he's like, I think the whole department there is going to fold and dissolve. 
And I just, I went into a panic, you know, I was like, that's my money. That was my, you know, am I ready? And it's kind of a sink or swim. So uh, I dove into it and just started working on this full time. And occasionally I'll pick up a little side project. So now it's like 1090. So it's about 10% of my time. I'll, I'll do something that's um, for a client. But at this point, it's really, I mean, the more I do it, the, the more interesting I feel the projects are, not just to me, but to everyone else. Um, you know, I've made music for years and I think it was very popular to a very niche, small scene. <laughs> and it's uh, been interesting to work on this system, which not just appeals to like an avant-garde music scene, but appeals to, I mean, I've been able to have really great conversations with neuroscientists, with psychologists, um, uh, just across the board in terms of both uh, science and, and art and humanities. So uh, this project has, has been the most uh, exciting one that I've worked on, you know, in my life. And um, it also ties in a lot of threads of my life of, you know, I've meditated for, you know, about 20 years now. And so uh, for me to have the experience with meditation, with computer programming, with uh, music production, all those combined into being able to produce a project that, you know, uh, each step of it, I haven't had to hire someone or, or rely on someone else's um, uh, labor to create it. So that's, I feel really grateful for, in many ways, having a very broad education because I was able to learn in multiple fields. Um, and at the core of it is learning how to learn. You know, I mean, uh, this last few weeks, I've been reverse engineering the the software that runs this headband, so I can have more control over it. And I, you know, I don't have a computer science degree, but I've been learning about you know computer bytes and eight bit versus sixteen bit versus thirty two bit. Um, and that's you know that's what's amazing about the internet is the access to uh, be able to learn these things and, and build these things. You know, and it's um, I feel incredibly lucky. Well, in true Iowa form, you were smart and you're positive, you know, turning things around when you got laid off and innovative. Um, so again, just congratulations and really amazing. I'm going to throw your website into the chat. Um, while, I'm do while I'm doing that, why don't you share your screen and uh, get ready for the demonstration and just kind of tell us what we're going to be looking at. Okay. Visually, I'll be sharing, I'll be screen mirroring. Uh, the output is currently on my iPhone, so you'll be able to see my brainwaves. Um, let me launch that software. And I'll just let you explain um, you know, what we're going to be seeing, and then if you want to jump into your performance, we'll, we'll let you have at it. Are you able to see my uh, visual output now? I just want to confirm. Yep. Great. Um, so what you'll be seeing is uh, um, I'll be wearing the EEG headband and like I mentioned, it's similar to the motion sensor system. It'll be transmitting the electrical output of my brain uh, via Bluetooth to this app, which I'll hold up. So this app is what I'm uh, screen sharing onto the um, Zoom as well. So you'll be able to see it. But the app I developed um, takes in the information from my brain and um, it splits it into five different waves. And you may have heard of delta waves, theta waves, alpha waves, uh, beta and gamma. And those waves are at different frequencies. Delta is the lowest and gamma is the highest, fastest. Uh, and those waves themselves are, um, they're a very low frequency compared to sound. So most of the waves are below the auditory level. Um, when I first got into this, I assumed thought it would be a real fast frequency, um, but it's from it's below the auditory level. So we can hear down to about 30 hertz, which would be a very base, sub bass. Um, when you get down to like that 30 range, you more feel the sound rather than hear it as it gets lower and lower. And then once you drop, you know, to about 20 uh, or and lower, um, you just can't hear it anymore. Th those waves, our ears don't pick up on that. But that's the range where a lot of brain waves are. And so uh, zero to about four is delta, uh, four to eight is theta, eight to 12 alpha, and then so on going up to, I think gamma, 
some EEGs read up to about 35 or 40 hertz, some open up gamma to about 100 hertz. So that would be in the auditory range. Um, it's a bunch of tech talk about brain waves, but um, with those waves, what I've discovered and other people, you know, uh, particularly in the science field with EEG research is that those brain waves tend to correlate with different thoughts and feelings and energy levels uh, in the brain. And uh, one of the things I tried when I first got this was if I think a specific word, you know, will, will that be different? If I think the word one versus the word two, will I be able to pick up on the difference of, of that? And the best way I can explain it was a metaphor I read about in a EEG paper. And it talked about one of the limitations with the EEG compared to, um, I forget the name of the scanner, that's maybe MRI, but an EEG is because it's outside of the skull, um, it's almost like being outside of a stadium. So if I'm outside of a stadium, uh, I can tell if, let's say it's baseball, um, I'm not super a sports guy, but I do know baseball. So if someone hits a home run, you can tell th that's happened. You, you can get a sense of, of the um, uh, fans and, and you know, cheering. If something bad happens, you, you, know, you can feel that uh, just, just by here. But you can't hear individual conversations if you're outside the stadium. And so that's how an EEG is. It's, it's making readings of the general states of the mind. You know, it's not thought specific. And what's end up happening with this is the more I use it, the more I'm able to control that crowd inside of the stadium and get them to, it's almost like getting the audience to do the wave, you know, like getting them to um, the electricity inside my brain to behave in certain ways, knowing what the musical output will be. And that will allow me to um, compose. Um, and it's very, much like a, a fluid environment. It's almost like moving through water, uh, the way of uh, electricity moving through the mind. Um, and so that's what you'll hear is, is upon the EEG and perform for uh, a few minutes. And actually I need to switch sound kits before I forget. And the MIDI I'm pointing towards Ableton, which you'll be able to see on the screen. And the current system, so I, I'll, I'm composing live, but I'm not uh, choosing the sounds live. The sounds are from these sound kits, which it's almost like switching from like a piano to an organ to you know a different type of uh, keyboard. Um, and this will take maybe 20 seconds to load. Um, a future version of this is I'll be taking the brain waves to shape the actual uh, sounds as well, and so to take a pad sound and shape it into a kick sound. Um, but the current version that I'll be performing is the all the composition is coming from my brain. Um, and also some of the uh, manipulation of the sound. So filters and effects, the reverb and high pass and low pass filters, I'll be uh, moving. Um, got the color wheel. Um, which is normal. It usually takes a, a bit to load. And so the MIDI will be pointing into uh, different um, synthesizers that are loaded on the computer. And then I don't know if I'll be able to lift it up, but um, I also have a little uh, synthesizer, a outboard one hardware synthesizer, it's electron digitone. So some of the sounds will be coming from the digitone. So I'm sending the MIDI both to my computer software and the external synthesizer and those sounds are being mixed together. All right, and I'm open to any questions afterwards. I'll get started.
it's interesting it takes a minute for the so you can see the brain waves are dark here but it takes a minute for the screen share to catch up so i wonder what the delay is on that um so when i take the there it is so when i take the headband off it you know all the colors drop off and the and the readout drops off um and i forgot to mention that the colors themselves um so if you saw reds and blues and purples those are based on my brain waves i created a um, brain wave to rgb converter and um Delta waves, which are more alert or stressful, would be the red color mixed in. Um, and blue is alpha wave, which is a meditative or um, alpha waves actually go up when I listen to music. So if I ever get lost, particularly during a performance, I can just listen to the music and I'll hear the alpha sounds come back and that becomes my foundation. And I can compose uh, from there. And the sounds I chose correlate to the the feeling of the wave and so um, alpha waves are lower dreamier uh, bassier and the other waves as they go up in frequency make up more of the synth sounds or the higher sounds as they moves up into more um, activated thought well, that was uh, really fascinating um... I think uh, it's it's strange because it sort of takes a second to get going. You can sort of feel that, um, you know, pulsing through. It's like the Pixies sort of loud, quiet, loud concept, um, but but with your brain waves. So that was that was really amazing. I wish I would have put my headphones on um, during that. But people can go to your website and and see YouTube videos and yep. um, you know listen further. Uh, so the chat is open if anyone wants to send some questions in. I've already gotten a few questions, but you can just ask your question directly to me through the chat, and I'll uh, relay that to um, Jason. But the, the first one we have is, what are you thinking about when you composing? When you had that on, what were you thinking about? It's a great question. Um, so the thought process is similar to... It's almost like, what do you think about when you play guitar? Or what do you think about when you're uh, surfing? Um, so it's not like C note or B note or um, filter open, filter close. It's more of the feeling of what do I need to do internally to stay, let's use the surfing metaphor, what do I need to do to stay on the board? in terms of like moving forward or moving back and getting instant feedback. So with surfing, the feedback is through physics. You know, you'll, you'll feel gravity or like oh, I'm about to fall. And with this, the feedback I'm getting is through the sound and occasionally I'll look at the visuals as well. Um, but it's actually easier for me to compose with my eyes closed. And so as I get the feedback, I can learn to metaphorically move forward or move back and stay balanced and, and hear the sounds and learn to, the more I use it, the, the better I get at manipulating this. And so at times I've seen visuals in my brain of um, just currents of electricity and then seeing uh, in my imagination manipulating those and then hearing the output through the sound. And so I'm learning to control my brain more the more I use this system because I'm getting this biofeedback. Uh, sometimes with more uh, rhythmic uh, music, this one isn't um, hooked up to a, a, a tempo, but um, I have a build that will start using a PPG, which can get your heart rate, and that will emit um, a steady beat or <laughs> an alternating beat as, as my heart goes up and down. Um, and sometimes with more rhythmic music, I start to see a circle moving. And so it's, it's very much a, it's like a physical process. It's almost like physically modeling shapes in my brain and then hearing the output. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Prior to this call, I know you had talked about, it looks so relaxing and it was relaxing for all of us, but for you, you said it was kind of draining. And so we have some people, um, you know, kind of wanting to dive into that science side of things. We are getting quite a few questions and I want to be cognizant of time. So um, can somebody that can't speak use this and create music? Who can't speak? Yeah. No, if you're mute. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I haven't tested it on someone that's mute. I've tested on someone who uh, has synesthesia and the levels are really high because as she closed her eyes to her own visuals, just that her brain produced were through the roof. And so all of her brain waves, you know, you saw mine dancing along. Hers would have just been at the top of the screen. 
um, I've put the system on someone who was blind and um, uh, saw his brain waves. Um, and I've put the system on probably, it was with Iowa City, I did a presentation to, it's like a whole summer camp. It was like 60 kids. I was like, the most difficult presentation I've ever done. I was like, how do you, how do you explain brain waves to a bunch of seven year olds? And they got it. They love the system. Um, I was afraid they'd be nervous about trying it, but they lined up and it was almost chaos at the end once they realized that time was going to be cut short. Um, and with kids, I noticed the, the waves are, um, the brain is smaller, so it's not outputting as much electricity. So their waves are actually, um, fewer decibels. Uh, so yeah, someone who can talk or any other disability absolutely could put this on uh, because it's not based on the senses. It's based on the electricity coming off the brain. And anyone who puts it on, there's going to be sounds that come out. Uh, the thing that changes is with time or with something like a meditation practice, learn to control the, the motion and the movement of, of thought in the brain. And, and that, that's what allows the control. So here we got a few questions that are sort of along those lines. Um, is are you using this, or is it possible to use this? Do you think to treat mental illness or somebody with the traumatic brain injury? Are you using that at all, or have you tried it at all? I haven't, but I, I'm sure it could. Uh, that is something I want to explore as as the system um, becomes more involved. Something I mentioned um, before we started was uh, I'm reverse engineering the software that runs the headband so i have more direct access to the raw data coming off the the eeg sensors and um i'm almost done i'm about 80 percent done with the the reverse engineering process uh and i think having more um having that access to the raw data will allow me to do more scientific oriented uh, experiments rather than just having the data that was being output by the software development kit by the um, headbands creator. Um, and that's something I think would be really exciting to do with the university. You know, the, I met with, a um, uh, his name was in young. He was over, I think it was in a auditory department, but he was researching what the brain waves do. Um, when the, what does the brain do when a person listens to music and how does it start to predict what's going to happen next? And so I actually learned a lot about alpha waves from him. Um, so that, that is something I definitely want to do is, is see how this could connect and help more people and connect with different uh, fields. And again, this, we were just talking about this. Um, have you ever fallen asleep with it on and what happened? <laughs> sure. Uh, so I have, I've, I've napped uh, with it. And what was really interesting is as I was napping, um, the mind goes through different phases. It's not like I close my eyes and I'm suddenly dreaming. There's this uh, stair step process of, of moving down. And um, what was interesting with having the system on was each time I started to move into a new phase or pre-dream imagery almost blooms like a flower. So when a new image or a new sensation would bloom, I would hear it. And when I would hear the sound, it would remind me, oh, I'm falling asleep with an EEG on. I'm actually, I had set something up when I was conscious. And so it became this really interesting lifeline back to consciousness, um, almost like deep sea diving. So I had this, as I was going deeper and deeper into my consciousness, uh, subconscious, I had this line back up to the surface to remind me, hey, you're actually, uh, you have an EEG on. And so the sounds would change and different ones would get triggered as I'd go deeper and deeper. It was fascinating. And then eventually I, I did fall asleep and then woke up to more sounds. Um, that's, that's so interesting. Um, we'll maybe do one more question here. And then I think you were going to do kind of a present, uh, one more demonstration as we're um, closing the meeting out, but um, mm -hmm. could someone that's not able to speak, is it possible to use this technology instead of music to turn it into uh, a computer that would allow them to speak? It's a good question. Um, I would have to dive deeper in and work with someone who knows more of the, the science of language. Um, I've actually always been a very nonverbal person. Uh, I was super shy, so it took forever to be able to talk as much as I am right now. 
Um, so what I don't know is, you know, the limitation of the EEG is, like I said, it's being outside the stadium. And so can you form words based on that information? Music is more of an abstract um, in shape, whereas language is very specific. It's a very concrete um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, so that's what I don't know is with the information outside the stadium, could that start to form um, sounds? And I know that there has been work with EEG to be able to control a cursor or play a video game. And I think that's if you target in on a specific um, brainwave and be able to learn to manipulate that single brainwave, then you can you know, control something on a screen. But even that, that's a pretty limited, you know, that's, um, you know, up, down, left, right, whereas language has so many combinations. Um, it is something I'm interested in. I would like to start mapping instead of sounds. I want to take different uh, syllables and consonants from English and start connecting certain brain waves to those consonants and then learn, can I form sentences? and then when I form the sentences or words, can I then start to f correctly identify which wave can emit certain syllables and then start to control language? So that would be a way of kind of uh, going through the process reverse is just plug it in, see what comes out, and then tweak the system so words start to form. Well, it really sounds like you're on the forefront of what at one time might have been science fiction, and here you're combining all these artistic elements with um, science and technology. So uh, I have a feeling that this is really going to take off and go far and um, probably change the world. Um, you mentioned a lot about uh, doctors, so I'll let you kind of get ready to set up to do your performance because in, um, in August, all of our chat from the old caps are actually doctors, PhDs, and MDs. So if anyone in the audience wants to join us for those, you can. But in July, it's all artists. So we have you this week. And next week, we have uh, Monica, Monica Correra, who is the um, head of 3D design at the university. And so she's going to be showcasing some of her um, designs and how she works with students and be talking a lot about that. So I will put that um, in the chat if anyone wants to register for that. Um, so we'll let you kind of take us out. We will, we have recorded this, we'll put it out on YouTube and send it to everybody shortly. Um, and then we'll just let you go for a few minutes and then I'll end the meeting for all. So Jason, this has been just really enlightening and fascinating and um, very cool to see and you are truly a pioneer. So we wish you nothing but the best in moving forward. And when you're back on campus, please let us know and we'd love to come see you perform. So best of luck to you. Great, thank you, Tony. And this uh, last sound kit is um, fairly noisy, so enjoy.
Thank you again, everyone.